Good morning. Welcome to Homestead by Chance. Today I have a lot of projects in my kitchen and I thought maybe you'd like to see what I'm up to. I have three big ones today. We're going to bake some bread, we're going to can some baked beans, and we're going to can some milk. Did she say canned milk? Yes, I did say canned milk. It's a lot easier than you think it is. And it's a great way to grab those bargains at the store when you see a gallon of milk that's been discounted because the sale date is in a couple of days. You can it up, you're good to go for a while. All right, so the first thing that we're gonna do is we're gonna start with the bread. Now the three things that I'm doing today all have different time frames and this and that and different things that you have to do. And so I'm sort of putting them on top of each other. This is a good lesson in time management as well, because I actually spent the morning like literally staring into space. Okay, this takes an hour, this takes 30 minutes, then I have to do this and figuring out my time management, okay? So if you are only interested in the bread, then you know, you're gonna wanna skip through a little bit and go to those parts. If you're only interested in the baked beans, et cetera, et cetera. Although the baked beans, as far as putting it all together, that's gonna happen pretty quick. And so is the milk, right? Once they go in the canner, that's the long process. Um, the bread, I actually started, I guess technically I started it yesterday morning. I took my sourdough starter out of the fridge. I keep it in the fridge because I'm not baking every day. And I woke it back up by adding some water and flour to it. And then of course it sat throughout the day and got all active and bubbly and it was all happy. And then last night I mixed everything up and I put it in bowls. I'm gonna make, be making two loaves of bread today. And um, that sat in the oven overnight with just the light on and then that was able to rise. And so that's the first thing I'm gonna do is it's gotta sit and rise some more. So let's get that out of the oven. So like I said, I have two loaves that I'm baking. One is a standard sourdough. So it just looks like regular dough. The other one is a little bit of an experiment. So this I added, you can see how it's darker um, than this one. This one I added dock seeds to. And if you don't know about dock seeds, I have another video on dock seeds. So you'll want to watch that one and learn about that. It's a great way to extend your flour. And I haven't done it in a sourdough. I've done pancakes and crackers and, you know, but um, I thought, let's try a sourdough and see how that goes. So anyway, this is a bit of an experiment. All right, so first things first. Get that one out of the way. We're gonna pull the dough out of the bowl. Look at that, it deflates down. Because it's been all happy. A little sticky. So now we're going to get this rolled up and ready for our loaf pan. Okay. And it actually ended up sitting in the oven a little bit longer than I anticipated because I ended up doing other things this morning. It's gonna need, it's really sticky. That's okay. I'm gonna get some more flour. And guess what, I put this in the way. Got my flour right here. Still got goop on my hands. If you're not the kind of person that spends a lot of time in the kitchen, and you want to be, you want to set up your kitchen so everything is accessible, the things that you use the most, et cetera, et cetera. Okay. So I just put some flour on there. It's already it's sticking to my island. Should have put some flour down. Lesson to self right there. All right, here we go. Get a little bit of flour in there, get rid of that stickiness. Normally I wouldn't do all this kneading, but it was a little stickier than I anticipated. That's okay. Bread does what bread does. And 
And we've got to get this formed into a loaf. And I've got my loaf pans over there. They're all ready to go. So I want to kind of roll this, make a tight roll for my loaf pan. Stick that there. Now, my dot version one, okay? It's a little sticky too. So that's okay. Now I have my flour down. Pull that out of the bowl. It's really sticky. And I can smell that that uh, quintessential sourdough smell, right? So I know that it's active and happy. All right, put that out of the way. I'm going to do the same thing, get a little extra flour in here. Wow, that really, that's got a lot of moisture in it. I'm surprised. It didn't have that much when I put it in the oven last night. But here we are, learning together. More flour. Yeah, I'm gonna need a lot more flour. That's interesting. So, my little experiment here, it appears that the dock seeds, and I'm gonna tell you what I did, um, because the dock seeds, they're part of the buckwheat family, so they, they're they a harder flour, right, than just our regular white flour that we use. So in order to soften them up, I soaked them in water for 24 hours. So I had kind of a, I guess what you could call a short ferment. And so it looks as if those dock seeds soaked up quite a bit of that water. And then as they, I mixed everything in last night, and then as they sat in the dough overnight, it appears that they must have released some of that water back into the dough. So that's interesting. Now part of my experiment here. And this, the dock version, has a much stronger sour smell than the regular version over there. Um, so that's interesting as well. All right, so I think it's, it's still a little sticky, but I think that's probably enough flour to be added. So I'm going to do the same thing. I'm going to roll it towards me, make my loaf, and yeah, a little more flour. Why not, right? So it won't stick to the pan here. All right. And whoa. Get this over here. And then what I'm going to do is take a damp cloth and lay that over these. I'm going to put this back in the oven for about 10 minutes and then I'll transfer it to the loaf pans and it will rise for one to two hours. I like to give it a long rise. That's just personal preference. Um, and then it'll go in the oven for about 40 minutes. You have this lovely sourdough bread. But right now I'm gonna wash my hands. Get off all this stickiness. And a lot of it, I'm kind of surprised. So that's a very interesting, um, experiment or outcome of my dock experiment that that fermented or that soaked, soaked those soaked dock seeds seem to actually be releasing some of that 
water back into the bread. So that's really interesting. All right. So this just goes back in for about 10 minutes. Normally I wouldn't do a timer. Um, but because I'm doing other things, I want to keep track. And that'll, you know, alert me. So put everything away. I am a clean as I go kind of person. I don't like for there to be big messes while I'm trying to cook. So I'll clean as I go. And of course, this is a pretty big one here. I ended up having to add a lot more flour than anticipated. trash can. So this will take up some of that 10 minute time as well. Now you're probably sitting there like, why am I watching this woman clean her kitchen while I could be doing other things? Well, just a little unanticipated mess, which is life, right? That's what we talk about. That's the point. And sharing this with you is your, you get to share my unanticipated messes with me. That didn't take so long. And I'll do a deep clean later, but that just gets the gunk out of the way. Something else, you're going to be working in the kitchen. So you notice I have a hand towel here. This is to dry my hands to keep them clean. This is my wiping towel. This is the one that is designated to wipe up all the little things. If I have a big spill, I want to get something else for that. But my little spills, I just want something designated for that that I can just do a quick wipe and it's gone. All right, so bread is in there for about 10 minutes. The next thing I want to do is can my milk. And normally, if I were just doing this on my own, I would do this after I did the baked beans. But I thought it might be nice if you guys could see the whole canning milk process, because it's actually not that long. I wanted to go ahead and do that and show it to you. All right, so I'm going to get my milk. As you can see, reduced, right? I don't know if you can see that. <laughs> reduced, because the date is September 1st, okay? So... We're not going to drink all this, right? Um, as a matter of fact, it's 1%. I don't care for 1% if I'm drinking milk, but I can use it in cooking and things like that. Most of my cooking that I would do with milk calls for about a cup of milk. So drying it in a pint is great. And then whatever little bit is left, my son can put in his cereal, you know, and add the regular milk to it that he likes, whatever it is. All right. When canning milk, everything is cold. Cold canner, cold milk, cold jars, okay? That's how you start whenever you can milk. After that, well, with that, actually, it's very simple, all right? So I'm going to open my milk here, and I'm just going to pour milk into the jars. Now, milk tends to siphon quite a bit. Siphon means that in the canning process, because... The lid, the flat that goes on there, it actually lifts during the canning process. That's the reason for the ring to keep the lid on. And what can happen is the milk can actually come out. And the siphoning actually happens not during the canning process, it happens during the cooling process. All right. And so I find that if I give my milk a bit more headroom than maybe you normally would for other canning liquids. Like my chicken broth, I there's barely any head space at all. But the milk, I want to give more space. So what happens is I usually end up with nine pints of milk. There are eight pints of milk in a gallon. But a lot of times I will end up with nine jars, <laughs> I should say, because I'm allowing more head space than I normally would. So I just pour in, I'm going 
I'm pouring it to just below um, the neck here, maybe a little bit lower. Um, I'd rather go with a low with a greater head space, lower milk height, and um, and not have that siphoning because when milk siphons. Ooh, it's a mess. All right, so two, four, six, eight. There's still milk left. All right, so one more. And look at that. Nine pints. All right. There's my nine pints of milk. All right. When you can other things, uh, especially pressure candy, you want to put some vinegar in your water because that will help to prevent um, the little crustiness and that, that white powdery stuff and, and all of those things. When you can milk, no vinegar, no vinegar, okay? <laughs> vinegar and milk makes cheese. And like, remember I said how the lid can lift just a little bit? Well, some of that vinegar can actually get in the milk and it doesn't take much at all. So I've seen people say, I canned my milk and and it's, it's curdled. It looks so weird. And it's like, yeah, you made cheese. <laughs> so this is not vinegar. Normally, you would wipe your rims with vinegar. This is just water on a paper towel. That's all it is. And I'm just making sure that in case there was a little bit of milk that splashed, because you want your rims to be nice and clean. Um, so I'm just making sure that I get anything that might have splashed at all. For my baked beans, because I will be adding chicken broth to that, I will be using vinegar to clean those rims. And I've also got um, other things that can be a little greasy um, that will be put in there too. All right, so after that, like I said, everything is cold. So my flats are not in water or anything. I'm just going to put them on as is. And if you notice, they have writing on them. Yes, I reuse my flats. So this is milk that I bought for $3.19. If one of them comes unsealed, I really haven't lost that much money. And I would rather save my new lids, my new flats, for more expensive food items. So I've got about two and a half minutes left. So it is perfect, right? Time your stuff. I put the bread in there. I've got about two and a half minutes left until I put it in the loaf pans. Now it's got a long rise after that, but I've accomplished something else while waiting for my 10 minute rise. All of my milk is ready to go. I have my canner already filled with water, okay, cold water. Now everything just goes in. Just as simple as that. And that's it. Nine pints of milk. Put the lid on. I'm going to bring this up a little bit slower than I would say the baked beans or anything else that I'm canning because I'm starting cold. So I wanna make sure that it gets that warm all the way through the milk, all right? So I'm gonna start it at about medium, okay? As opposed to anything else I might put on medium high, all right? So uh, there's only a minute left. So we're just gonna go ahead and do that. So I'm gonna take the bread out. I'm going to put it in my loaf pans. All right. Good. Okay. All right, here we go. I think I'll put my regular bread. I've got a hard-sided standard metal baking pan, uh, or loaf pan, and then I've got a silicone one as well. I have two smaller silicone loaf pans, um, but you end up with these like little, little teeny tiny slices of bread and they're great. But if you want to eat a sandwich, you feel like you have to eat two sandwiches in order to get enough. So 
I'm gonna try to get some bigger bread out of this. All right, they've already, my pans have already been sprayed, so they're ready to go. And this one ended up being bigger, right? Because um, I had to add flour to it because it had so much moisture in it. So this is gonna be interesting. That is a nice experiment, right? Put that in there. All right, get this out of the way. And same thing, they're gonna go back in the oven. This time they're gonna go in for about two hours. One and a half or two hours. And I'm gonna put that damp cloth back on. All right. They are ready to go. Or they're ready to sit. <laughs> However, that's however you want to say that. So the canner is on, slowly heating up. Okay, it's going to take a little bit for it to heat up, and then we'll talk about the process of what you do whenever it gets to temperature and then whenever it gets to the pressure process as well. It's a little bit different from your normal panning. All right, so next up, baked beans. Okay. This is one of our favorite recipes. And it has all of these ingredients that go in. So it's quite a bit of stuff. So I wanna start with, this is hickory syrup, okay? And this is literally from a hickory tree. It's not tapped like a maple tree. It's a shag bark hickory tree. And you peel off the bark, break it up, and you put it into a pot with water, and you boil it. And you end up with a hickory syrup. And you can add sugar to it if you want. You can thicken it down, like if you wanted to put it on pancakes or something like that. But I prefer this for our baked bean recipe. So I'm gonna open this up, nice and sealed. And um, have you ever seen one of these? This is a church key. So this is how you open your pan goods. All right, I only use this on the pint lids because I find that the wide mouth lids, it, uh, because they're so much bigger, it kind of peels the rim a little bit. So. I like to use this guy for my wide mouth, and I'll show you that in a little bit too. All right, hickory syrup. I don't measure anything except for the dry beans, which, oh, by the way, so I soaked these overnight, and I already drained them so that they're ready to go. Soak your beans overnight, okay? And put them, a pint jar, when you're doing navy beans, a pint jar is uh, three quarters of a cup of dry beans, okay? Put a three quarter cup of dry beans in there, put hot water on top of it, let it sit overnight, drain it in the morning. Okay, so easy. All right, so I don't measure anything, so I'm just gonna pour some syrup. And I can come back and add, if I have some left, which I am, which is fine. I don't think I shortchanged you. I may have shortchanged you. See, just like that. Look at that. Everybody got a little bit. Okay. My hickory syrup is in. All right. Ingredients. I have done a billion batches of baked beans trying to find the right combination. And this is what we like. Okay. A little bit of Worcestershire. Worcestershire. Okay. And I literally... I mean, I'm just splashing. That's all I'm doing. I don't really care. They don't have to be the same. Splash that in there. All right. Teriyaki sauce. Yes, you heard me right. Teriyaki sauce. Just a little bit, so less than your Worcestershire. Oh, look what I did. I oversplashed. Teriyaki sauce everywhere. All right, 
Did any get in here? I'm not even sure any got in the jar. <laughs> so that splashed a lot more than the Worcestershire. And just get a little splash in each one. Clean up all the messes. All right, turmeric. Turmeric has a lot of flavor to it, but it's also really good for you. Uh, it just, it keeps you in good health. So you just want to put some of that. I put turmeric in almost everything we eat because of the health benefits. And it's, it's a strong seasoning, so you don't have to put it in a ton. White pepper. Maybe a little bit more of that. We like some kick to our beans. Chili powder and paprika. Okay. Paprika I like for the smoky flavor. The chili powder I like for the health benefits, believe it or not. It's got vitamin K in it. So that's something that our body doesn't really produced too well, so we need to get our vitamin K by other means. So if you put a little bit of chili powder in everything you eat, which I tend to just put a dash of chili powder in a lot of stuff, then you're getting that. Paprika. I just love smoky paprika. Did you know it's from Hungary? I use it in Mexican foods a lot, but it's not Mexican at all. <laughs> Cavenders. This is one of our favorite seasonings. Unsalted. So I put quite a bit of that in there. I have no idea what these measurements are. Don't ask me. I already told you. I don't measure stuff. I grabbed ginger. I was supposed to grab garlic. <laughs> All right. I'm a little bit lazy when it comes to garlic. I like to buy these squeeze tubes. They're pretty cheap. And I can buy a whole bunch. They can sit in my cabinet. And the one that I'm using goes in the fridge. Just makes life easier. <laughs> so I'm going to put a squirt of garlic in each. I don't know if you can see. You know about that much it's probably half a teaspoon because this is paste um you know i don't know what that equals to a clove but i don't feel like i need to use too much Whoop, that one had a bit more that's okay we like that and it's cold i had that one i thought that was garlic i had it sitting out so it'd be easy to squeeze huh. now it's really cold and it doesn't want to come out. Last one. There we go. All right. Garlic in. This is another one that's not necessary to the flavoring, but it's coyote squash powder. Coyote squash is really high in tons of nutrients and vitamins and all kinds of stuff. So this is something that I read about. I actually found them at the grocery store, coyote squash. I found them at the grocery store in the old veggie bin. But I've never had a coyote squash, so for 99 cents, I'll buy a bag of coyote squash and try them out. I did not care for them, <laughs> but that's okay because I read that a really great way to use them is to slice it up, dehydrate, powder it, and then just put the powder in whatever it is you're making. You'll never know what's in there. And then you've added some um, nutrients to your food. So anytime that you can sneak in nutrients, especially with kids, right, is really, really great. This is the first time I'm using the coyote squash powder in this, but you're not going to be able to taste it. So I'm just going to put a little sprinkle in each. Everybody gets their fair share, and that'll add some nutrients to my baked beans that my son won't even know that he's getting. All right, then we want to add just a touch of molasses. In case you didn't know, molasses is actually really high in nutrients too. Molasses is the stuff 
that's left over when they refine sugar, okay? So the, this is blackstrap molasses. So this is like um, the last one. So they have different grades of molasses. So this is a really, really dark one and stuff like that. So it, it still has sugar in it, but it's a very bitter, sweet taste. So this is what they use to make brown sugar which they charge you a ton of money for, right? So buy white sugar, buy molasses, put them together, you have brown sugar, okay? I'm just gonna put a little drip in each. I don't know if that might be a teaspoon worth or a little bit more maybe, something like that. Should I say it again? I don't measure things. I just guess. It's gotten me through life. Everybody says my food tastes really good, so it must be good. <laughs> no measure. And it's drippy. This, this stuff is thick. It's gooey. And I use molasses in a lot of cooking. Oh, I made French toast this morning. I made, it was actually a French toast casserole, so I made it um, like a, what do they call it, not a slurry. A custard, that's what it's called. And you put molasses in the custard. Not a ton of molasses, but you put some molasses in the custard for that French toast casserole. All right. Okay, apparently my phone has a time limit on how long it can record. So thankfully, I caught it. And it was just right when I was washing my hands. So we're good to go. All right. Last two ingredients, all right? This one, barbecue sauce. And I know you're probably like, oh, that's cheating. Shouldn't you make your own barbecue sauce? Well, it's no different than using the garlic paste for me. That's making barbecue sauce is just one of those things I haven't gotten around to doing yet. There's so many things to do. So this is a convenience factor. Um, this one, this is Sweet Baby Ray's Honey Barbecue Sauce. We like this one, especially in the baked beans. And then we like all of those Sweet Baby Ray's products. Actually, they're really pretty good. And that's not a paid endorsement. That's just me being honest. And so we bought the Sweet Baby Ray's Secret Dipping Sauce. We didn't like it at all. But I got this giant bottle of dipping sauce, and it's like, I don't want to waste it. So I just started putting it in the baked beans whenever I make the recipe. And I think I'm to the point where I will probably get rid of this bottle today. So that'll be a good thing to get it out of my refrigerator. I don't put very much in, so you're not really gonna taste it in terms of like, oh, there's secret sauce in here. There's, I don't know, like maybe a tablespoon in each pint, something like that. But there's not much in this bottle, so I'm gonna use it up. Whatever happens to be left, which, yeah, that's pretty good. So that's good. This bottle gets to go away and leaves a space for more important things. Yay, look at that. That's all that was in there was just enough to do my fun. That's great. It's gone. All right. Last thing, the barbecue sauce. This you're going to put in, well, everything you're going to put in um, according to the taste, all right? So I'm probably gonna do a couple of tablespoons, actually. Squeeze some of that in there. And then usually whenever I open a jar and I put it in a pan to heat up, I might add a little bit more at that point too. All right, so these are all of my, what I call my seasonings. And then from here, I'm going to put in my sauteed onion and bell pepper, which I saute in lard, okay? Bacon grease, all right? That's important. That's gonna be a really different flavor than say sauteing it in butter. And we find that this tastes so much better when there's lard involved, okay? So I'm gonna put, and I, and I cooked it ahead of time, so if you're ready to go. So I'm just gonna put about a tablespoon in each to start. And then I can always go back and add more. 
And this again, this is your preference. Do you like a lot of onion and bell pepper in your baked beans? And add a lot of onion and bell pepper. And if, you're, if you've never done canning, you, you need these funnels. These are the most awesome thing ever. And there's a ton of different versions. I saw this really cool stainless, stainless steel one that actually had a strainer in the bottom um, on a video that I was watching. I was like, oh man, I gotta have one of those because then that leaves out all of that. Well, I gotta strain it first. So she was just straining it straight as she put it into the jar. I was like, dude, that is my jam. Just gonna go back and add some. Because remember, I don't measure anything. <laughs> All right, that's I think that's good enough. This one's gonna have a little bit of extra. That's okay. All right. Get all that down in there. I don't want to waste anything. That is good bell pepper and onion. It's going to taste so yummy. All right, how's my milk doing? I feel, ooh, it's nice and hot, so that's really good. So I'm going to go ahead and turn it up just a little bit more because I know that my camera is getting hot, so that's good. All right. Now, I made a little bit of a mess here putting all that stuff in, which when you're dealing with this kind of stuff is, is going to happen. So I'm going to wipe those rims really well here in a little bit. Uh, the last thing that you want to put in is chicken stock. You could do water, but um, I make my own broth. I make my own bone broth. And there are jars of it everywhere in the house. So anything that says to use water, um, I'm going to use my broth instead. And it's really going to add to the flavor of whatever it is as well. So this is a wide mouth jar. So I'm going to show you this little tool here. This is for taking off lids. And you can use it by itself, but it's going to put a big dent, big divot in the top of your lid. So you take a knife, and it can be any kind of knife. This is a sharp cutting knife. It can be just a regular butter knife. Doesn't make any difference. This has a wider blade, so I like to use this one. And you find the spot on the lid where the ring, the, the screw for the ring ends. And I'm going to put my blade across the top like that. And then I'm going to take this, I'm going to put it where there's Nothing there. It's the widest point. Let me show you. See if I can get this closer. So this is where this is where the jar, the screw part ends, and then there's like that wide part right there. So I'm gonna put this tool where that widest part is. Okay. So I'm gonna place this on top. This is gonna prevent that divot. And then I'm gonna put that under the lip. Everything, hold on to everything. And I go slow because I, I don't want to bend the rim because I reuse them. So I'm, I'm like really careful. And like that. And it just unseals, it pops off. And there we go. We're good to go. And then my favorite thing to do. Oh, it smells so good. Homemade broth. Okay. If you've never made homemade broth, if you want to get into canning, making broth is like your first thing that you can do. Smells so good, tastes so good. Do you think I like homemade broth? Because I like homemade broth. All right, so I'm gonna pour, and it's gonna kind of bubble down. So you'll you'll have to pour and then come back around because it'll get into all the little crevices. And I figured I would need more than one jar. So I did bring another jar. This one, this is, I think this is probably a cheese sauce jar. Um, I reuse everything, okay? I have so many jars. 
my broth I put in, that's an older jar, which is the reason why it was in a wide mouth um, canning jar. But my broth I put in the store-bought commercial jars. Uh, so anything that I buy, boy, I'm going to save that and put my broth in it. When you make broth, you're essentially making something, it, it's almost free. All it's going to cost you is your electricity for, you know, your roaster and your canner and stuff and your time. And that's it. Um, I need to do a video on broth. Don't I? So I'm going to put, put it in these jars. And then, of course, I end up with all these weird sizes, but that's fine. <laughs> all right. So pour my broth in there. Uh-oh. That one's making a mess. All right. I was going to show you this in a minute. <laughs> this is a stir stick or a debubbler. And on the end is a magnet so that when you heat your lids, you can pull your uh, lids out of the water that they're in. Um, but it's a debubbler. And so I want to make sure. Well, I just made a great big mess. Broth everywhere. Okay. So when I pour my broth in, there's a reason I said you're going to go back because you want to de bubble. You get the air out, and everybody gets nice and happy with lots of liquid. Now, as I soaked these overnight, um, they're going to be nice and happy in the canner because they've already, they're already full of water don't worry they're still going to have plenty of flavor because that pressure canner is going to you know it's going to make them suck in all of the seasonings and everything that you put in there and i'm not too concerned about um trying to mix the seasoning in too much because the, the canner is going to do that. I mean, it's it's going to boil is what's going to end up happening. So everything is going to get mixed in there thoroughly. All right, you're not going to end up with a glop of seasoning on top or anything like that. All right, and all I'm doing is I am filling to the bottom of my funnel is what I'm doing. The funnels are basically designed to kind of give you um, that ability to sort of measure what's going in there. Because they fit down in there to that neck and it's almost, and it's almost uh, perfect in terms of measuring to where you need your headspace for something like beans. All right. Looks like a little bit here. See, I've got some broth left in my jar. And probably, these are probably going to siphon a little. That's okay. Um, siphoning just shortens your shelf life in terms of the seal. All right. These things are going to be gone so quick. I'm not worried about it. All right, a little bit of a mess here. That's okay. I'm going to go ahead and wipe with a dry paper towel because um, I'm kind of sloppy putting everything in. I mean, if you're going to wipe everything down anyway, you know, what difference does it make? So I'll get all the gloppiness off. And... Oh, they smell fantastic. Oops. Off the bottom. So, like I said, I, I do, I'm a clean as, as I go or a clean as I cook kind of person. Ooh, that one's messy. And there are different ways to do that, right? You can kind of do a big, big clean. You know, you clean it up with like a whole bunch of stuff, or you do just a little bit at a time. 
So I did my kind of my big gloppy clean. Now, this is vinegar. Um, this is cleaning vinegar. Regular vinegar, regular white vinegar is 5%. This is 6%. Uh, doesn't matter. It's still food safe. And the fact that it's in a spray bottle, so if I'm cleaning my counters or something like that, or I need vinegar on a paper towel, it's very convenient. And I just buy the big bottles of cleaning vinegar and then just fill that guy back up. So it's a little bit of a time saver. It's convenient. All of those things. I, I love things that are convenient to my, my cooking in the way that I do things. And you can find your own things that are convenient to you. Uh, my husband will do the dishes and he'll say, where does this go? And I'm like, the same place that it's gone for 17 years. <laughs> And he's like, I don't know where that is. Huh? So I show him where it goes. And he says, wouldn't it make more sense if it were over here or down here or in this drawer or whatever it is? And I'm like, do you cook? Are you the one spending your time in the kitchen? No. So it needs to be convenient for me, the person doing the cooking. All right, so I've got my jars nice and clean my rims nice and clean so next guess what the flats go on and yes these are all used lids these particular lids have been used one time before i have used a lid up to five times okay that's going to be something, though, that if it comes unsealed, I'm not going to be heartbroken, <laughs> right? Um, although, I have to be honest with you, the number of um, seal failures that I have, all right, we're going to knock on, knock on wood, right? The number of seal failures that I've had has actually been um, very limited over the years. I... I Read, there are some people that are like, um, I had three out of eight jars fail to seal. I'm like, oh my gosh. Um, and I mean, they're, they're doing everything they're supposed to do. They're cleaning the rims and they're, you know, making sure everything is clean. They're, you know, they're doing everything they're supposed to do. So, I don't know, maybe they're just un unlucky with bad batches. All right, so these need to go in the canner. I already have my water in here and my vinegar as well. So this, I can go ahead and turn up um, to the high heat setting so I can get it going quickly, all right? Beans and meat, they can at the same times, okay? A pint is 75 minutes and a quart is 90. And it doesn't matter what else is in there with it, because it is beans or because it is meat, it's going to can at that 7590. Okay? So I can go ahead and turn this up on high heat. That 7590 is just going to make sure that um, all the bacteria is killed and so that it's safe to be shelf stable. All right, so as I came over here, I can hear. I can hear my the canner that has the milk in it, and it is, I can, I can hear it starting to simmer, okay? So what I'm going to do is I'm going to let this do its thing, and it'll start to vent. And if you're not familiar with canning, that's when steam starts to come out of this vent right here. And I want, uh, once that is fully venting, and I mean it's going to go, and sputter and make all kinds of noise and lots of steam comes out and this little safety latch is going to pop up and that lets me know that the lid is locked down <coughs> oh, excuse me and once that happens i'm going to let it vent for 10 minutes okay that's something that you'll hear about pressure canning 10 minutes that's for 10 minutes my baked beans i don't really care i mean i'll let it vent for until I get tired of it, and then I'll just put the weight on and let it go. 
Um, but the milk, you want, it's got to vent for 10 minutes. Then you put the weight on, let it come up to pressure, which for where I am is 11 pounds. Let it come up to pressure for your altitude. Then turn the camera off and walk away. And that's it. That is how you can milk. Okay, very, very simple. All right. So we've got the bread rising in the oven. It's got uh, about an hour and a half to go. And my baked beans are on. They're waiting to get all heated up. The milk is warming, so it's good to go. So I'm going to clean up and we'll come back and see some of the results. All right. All right, my milk vented for 10 minutes, and it's coming up to pressure now. It's about to be finished. My baked beans are venting. Can you hear all the noise? Lots of sputtering and lots of steam coming out. My locks are both popped up. That means the lid is locked down, so you're not going to have any of those explosions that everybody's always afraid of. Uh, pressure canning is very safe. Basically, if you, if I were to put the weight on and literally just walk away, that would be a problem. The other problem, or the other issue that I hear about is the wife says, honey, I need to go to the grocery store. When the canner is finished, when the timer goes off, and the husband doesn't listen. And the very last thing he hears is take off the lid. And he didn't hear the whole part about lettering it pressure down and then taking the weight off and letting it pressure, blah, blah, blah. And you're not taking the lid off until like a whole hour later. And he goes in, he forces the lid off because that's what men do, right? <laughs> that's what my husband would do. He knows better though, I've taught him well. Uh, forces the lid off and then the whole thing explodes. Okay, so those are really gonna be the only two times that canning is unsafe, which means that you haven't followed the procedure of what you're supposed to do. And the procedure is very simple, okay? So my milk, right now my milk is at about 10 and a half pounds. For my elevation, I want 11 pounds, all right? My beans, they've, they've vented long enough. So I'm gonna take my weight and I'm gonna put that on. Turn down the temperature just a little bit, and I'm going to let that come up to pressure. Now, like I said earlier, that's 90 minutes, so you're not going to want to stick around for 90 minutes, all right? But the milk, the milk is now at 11 pounds pressure, which is exactly where I want it to be. So guess what? I'm going to turn off the camera. That's it, okay? I walk away. I'm going to let that pressure come all the way down. I'm going to then take, after the pressure is all the way down, I'm going to take the weight off, and I'm going to let it sit for at least 10 minutes, okay? Usually I wind up doing something else and it sits there a lot longer, which is fine, okay? Um, the slower your uh, venting, your, no, excuse me, uh, the slower your lowering in pressure takes, the less likely you're going to have siphoning, okay? And that's what I talked about earlier, where some of the liquid comes out. And in milk, that can be a mess. Milk is like concrete on the outside of a jar, okay? So I am fine with that sucker sitting there for a very long time, right? So I'm gonna let that pressure come down naturally. When it's completely down, take the vent off, or excuse me, take the weight off, <laughs> Let it sit for a while. I'll unlock the lid. I'll just rotate it, right? And you'll know you'll know that it's unpressurized because the lock will come down. Because otherwise, you won't be able to get the lid off, you know, unless you really want to force it. Um, I'll undo the lid. I'll let it sit for another ten minutes. See, I want I want it to be as slow as possible. Okay. Take the lid off, and then I'll take my jars out. Okay. Basically, it's the same thing for my baked beans. Okay. It's going to come up to pressure, right? I'm going to set the temperature where it can keep that even pressure. Then I'm gonna let it cook in the pressure canner or can in the pressure canner for 90 minutes. And when that time is up, same thing. Turn the heat off, I let it come down slowly, naturally. Same thing, take the weight off, wait, undo the lid, wait, 
all of those things. I have found through my personal experience that it is better to just wait that little bit of extra time. You can find something else to do. Um, usually, I do my canning in the evening, and then once it's finished its canning time, I turn everything off, I go to bed. And then when I wake up in the morning, guess what? It is definitely completely depressurized and it's ready to go take the jars out, okay? So there we go. Everybody is doing their things. They are nice and happy. So we'll come back later and see the results. Oh, we've got the, the bread that we're gonna start too, so, all right. All right, my timer just went off for the bread and happened to coincide with the uh, canner. So that's great. I'm gonna go ahead and get the bread out of the oven. So here's our regular sourdough. And here is the dock sourdough because this one's in a silicone mold that pushed out the sides, which is perfectly fine. I'm gonna let those cool. Now, the canner, the baked beans, the timer went off, so it's, it's finished, okay? So like I said, turn the heat off, walk away, okay? Let it pressure down, and then I'll take the jars out later. As a matter of fact, we're gonna go do some work on the property here in a little bit, so I, I'll just forget about it until we get back later tonight, and, and then it'll be all pressured down and ready to go. In the meantime, however, the milk is completely pressured down. So I'm gonna go ahead and open this up. Ah. Jumping pot holders. All right, I always wear pot holders when I take the lid off because there's a lot of steam in there, right? So you wanna be really careful. So I just take my time. I let the water drain off from the inside of the lid. All right, set that to the side. All right, now I've got my um, jar tongs, okay? I'm gonna set all of these over here, and then I'm just gonna let them cool overnight. So, the milk, uh, no siphoning. All right, so take these out. So. These are, the, the, the lifters are designed to hold the jars, right? But you have to remember that you're carrying a scalding hot glass jar of something. So I always put a pot holder underneath, just in case. It's a little extra security, never hurt anything. And this is all there is to it, okay? Pulling these jars out one by one, let them sit over here, and I'm just going to ignore them until tomorrow. Here, when uh, uh, pop, um, I'm just going to forget about them until tomorrow after church, you know, and then I'll take the rings off, make sure they're all sealed, label them, of course, and put them away. So that's all there is to it. So I can't wait to try this dock bread. Let the bread sit. I know. Smells so good. You want to eat some right now. Just just, just let it sit and cool. Pop it out of the pans. Let it cool on a rack and do its thing. All right, so that's pretty much it. Baked beans are pressuring down. I'll take those out later. Same way that you do the milk, right? Everything is the same. And that's it. So I will try to remember to put the uh, wild yeast starter recipe in the notes for the sourdough. And I need to make a video on that too, don't I? Ah, so many videos to make. So many new things to talk about and things to learn, isn't it great? All right, so if you want to learn some other things, obviously see the other videos, but I also have a blog page on MeWe and I'd love to have you join us there. And don't forget to hit that subscribe button. All right, Homestead by Chance. See you later.